Chapter 21, Terrified in America. I circled around and started back north. I saw the stable from two blocks off. There was a hitching post just down from it, so I tied Jingle Boy and commenced walking the rest of the way. I dug five of the chunking stones out of my tote sack and put three in my left hand and two in my right. I didn't have notion the first what a bear fighting dog would look like, so I ho hoped five stones would be enough in case me and it had a disagreement. As I got right on the stable, it happened in a flash. First thing that came to mind was Pa telling me that it, I didn't have to worry about uh, no barking dog, that it was a barking because it was just as scared as me. He said it was the quiet dog I had to be afeard of. That was the kind of dog that weren't interested in scaring no one. It was only in it, in, looking to bite something big and meaty off of you. Before I seen anything, I heard the sound of a chain rattling, then a hard grunt like something heavy was changing direction, sudden like. Other than those soft sounds, this bear fighting dog was quiet as an owl diving at a mouse. I saw a big black blur coming at me. At the same time, I tried to get out of the way. I threw left, right, left, as hard as I could. I heard a chain sing from getting pulled top. And the bear, bear fighting dog's paws hit me square in the side so strong, the last two chunking stones flew out of my hand. I want nothing but a dead duck. The spray of the dog's slobber splashed on my face, and I hit the ground hard, knocking my br breathing right out of me. The dog still didn't bark or nothing, but his front paws pressed like fists into my ribs. All I could do was wonder if he was going to rip me apart or squeeze the life out of me by standing on my chest. I closed my eyes and waited to get and waited to get suffocated or toured limb from limb, but didn't nothing happen. I opened my eyes, ah, but didn't nothing happen. I opened my eyes and saw the dog was out cold. His head was lolling up against my side. The head was huge, just about the size of a five-month-old calf's head, and was covered with scars. He was breathing fast like he'd just chased a rabbit, and little snorts of dust were blowing up with each breath he took. His feet were twitching like dogs do when they're having a nightmare. Just that quick, I noticed my ribs. It felt like someone had run a knife into him, and I looked down. The nails from one of the bear fighting dog's front paws had disappeared in the front of my shirt, and my blood was starting to leak out. I rolled underneath the dog's legs, then rolled twice more, and then laid in the dirt, waiting for my breathing to catch back up to me. After about five or six big gulps of air, I pulled my shirt up to see if there were any bones were poking through. There weren't nothing there but three tiny holes where his claws had gone in, and only one hole was bleeding at all. I felt to make sure weren't nothing broke. Other than poking three holes in me, it seemed like the bear fighting dog hadn't done nothing worse than knock the air out of my chest. I stood up and put two more chunking stones in my hand, then walked over toward the dog. One of my one of my stones had caught him right twixt the eyes. I know it was. I knowed it was the second left-hand one that chunked. There was a big knot swelling up there already. His tongue was hanging out from twixt long yellow and brown teeth that were about the size of bear claws. There was a little puddle of mud spreading in the dust where his tongue was resting. I didn't think I'd hurt him too bad, but I wasn't going to wait around to find out. I leaned against the door that led to the stable and pushed. When you first walk into a room in a house or into a clearing in the woods or on into the side of a stable, in, inside of a stable like this one, they have a way of telling you they know you're there. It ain't nothing particular noticeable, but the air inside of them changes like it's saying, I'm watching you. Some of the time it seems like the air is smiling and saying, I'm watching over you. Come on in. Some of the time it seems like it's all frowning and saying, I'm watching you and you best be careful. But I'd got into this stable so quiet and sneakish that nothing knowed I'd cracked open the door, held my breath, and took a step inside. I eased the door back shut and waited for my eyes to get used to the dark. I could see, all I could see was black, but going what I was hearing, I figured there must have been five or six horses held up in here. There was a swish, swish, swish of tails going at flies. There was the bumpity bump of hoofs shifting and scraping while I was trying to get comfortable. And there was a steady, easy, deep breathing of animals that had been worked hard trying to get some sleep. 
There was also a slow woo 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 sound from a barn owl hit hit out waiting for a mouse to make a mistake. It didn't sound like there was nothing to worry about right off. I let the air come out of my mouth and easy breathed back in through my nose. I knowed it just like that. There was something terrible wrong inside this stable. It weren't the horses. They smelt the same as Buxton horses. That weren't peculiar. It weren't the smell of the straw on the floor neither, but I could tell that whoever's chore it was to keep it clean weren't changing it regular enough. I could even smell that there was a goat or two somewhere in here. All those things were easy to tell and usual, but there was something else mixed up with all the time stable smells, something that just weren't sitting right. It weren't like a rat had curled up in a hole somewhere and died and then commenced to swelling up and rotting, but it weren't far from that. Or like a mule who had ate something bad and was ailing and leaking sickness, but it was kind of akin to that. It weren't one of them sick room smells neither. One of them rooms they tell you you ain't got no choice but to go in and say goodbye to someone that looks like they should have died a year or four, but it weren't exactly the backside of that kind of stinking. I didn't have much time to study on what was the strange smell was because my eyes started getting used to the dark and were picking out things. And when it comes to choosing to pay attention to your nose or your ears or your eyes, you got to listen to your eyes every time. Then my heart stopped beating. My blood ran cold. And time stood still. Someone was standing over at the other end of the stable. I acted like a fawn all over again. I quit breathing and froze all my muscles dead where they were at. Maybe whoever it was hadn't seen me. My eyes were slow getting more used to the dark and doggone it all, I started suspecting I knowed who I was seeing at the other end of the stable was a right Reverend Deacon Dr. Zephariah Connolly III, the stealer of dreams. But just like the smell in the stable, something weren't right about him. He was watching me from the other end of the stable, and I was pretty darn sure it was the preacher, but as real as he real slow started getting more and more lit up and less and less gray and shadowish, I began doubting what I first saw. He was being too still. The preacher always had something moving on him, either his hands or his legs or most of all his mouth. It just weren't right sitting. Uh, it just weren't sitting right seeing him standing there with his arms raised up on both sides of him and his head ducked down like he was studying something in the dirt. Or maybe that weren't it at all. Maybe he was doing the same thing I was doing, freezing every muscle so as I might not see him. We both stood still, froze that way for the longest time, waiting to see which one was going to move first. But finally, my legs took to twitching and feeling that they were about to bust out of fire. The preacher was better at this standing still business than me. He didn't move a finger. He kept his arms up there, patient as a rock, quiet as a scarecrow. But something just weren't right. I started stealing closer to him one slow step at a time. Then I heard a humming sound so near to my left-hand side that my blanked legs and breathing froze up all over again. Whatever it was that was making that sound was so close that even my eyeballs locked where they were at. I kept them straight ahead on the scarecrow that might be the preacher. Then slow as maple sap on a cold day, I started sliding my eyes off to the left, off to the direction that the humming sound was coming from. The only thing I could make out was that someone had leaned some dark bundles or sacks up against the left-hand side of the stable. There were five of them, all sitting in the same space apart, one from the other. The noise commenced again, sounded like someone fishing around trying to figure which song they're about to hum. I know I best quit holding my breath, else I was going to be forced to breathe in so hard it'd make a racket. I eased the air back into me like a bellows being pulled open slow and easy. I moved my eyeballs the tiniest bit more and saw exactly what it was that was making that music humming sound. It was one of the bundles. I ain't never gonna know if it was cause of the slow way the air was sliding back into me or if it was cause my eyes finally could make out what they were seeing, but my head got light and before I could do anything, my senses took off, squawking and flapping away like a flock of pheasants in a field. Next thing the stable floor felt, 
like it was rising and dropping like a fresh dried bread sheet being snapped and shook to four got folded. The way things were jumping round and my wits flew away, it didn't make no sense to try to keep standing. I knowed I'd best get a hold of something till the floor steadied itself, otherwise I'd pitch into the dirt. But it was too late. I looked at the humming bundle again and saw that it had arms. Four live moving arms. Two of them were tiny and mostly still, and two of them were big and moving. I couldn't believe I'd come all the way to the United States of America to see my first Hank. I didn't have no chance to get a hold on to nothing. My legs gave out and I crumpled toward the ground. I'd gone and got myself right in the middle of being fragile again. When your senses leave you sudden like and you start falling, you don't have the time nor the notion to put your hands up so as not to hit your head. Everything goes limp and flop, flops like okri. And since your head's the thickest part of you, most times leads the way down, it's always the first to bust the ground. But this time I did remember to keep my mouth shut. Part of the floor must have had planks laid down in it, because when my head hit, there was a loud sound like an axe chopping a thick oak. That one, that one good hit to my skull made me see stars, and it was terrible loud, because each and every one of those bundles that was on the wall came to life and unfolded itself with a powerful, horrible sound. The commotion they made when they moved was enough to wake the dead. Not from being loud, but from being terrific. It wasn't no human sound at all, but something about it did bring people to mind. It was groans and rough breathing mixed up with the same noise that the chain on the dog outside had made, which got me thinking. I was soon about to get ripped to shreds by the brothers and sisters of the dog that I'd chunked. The only difference was now the sound was times by five and was added to a bunch of whimpers and the hard sucking of air. What I was seeing weren't five sacks at all, nor five dogs looking to settle scores for me chunking their brother, nor five evil spirits come to life. None of that. What I was seeing was worse than all those things totaled up together. What was on the wall of the stable couldn't have been nothing but five squatted down demons that had been captured and chained by someone who was sending them back to Satan so they could snatch no one else's soul. I looked over to where the preacher was, hoping he'd do something to help, but got my attention drawn back to the quick chained demons. The forearmed one that was humming made a shushing sound at the rest of them and started talking, talking in English too. It whispered out to me, hoo hoo, is you real or is you hate? I lifted my head from the floor and without thinking what I was talking to said, pardon me, ma'am? She was the only one amongst a bunch that looked like a woman. And I ain't sure if it was the right thing to do to call a hate man, but the word came out anyway. She got clearer and clearer looking. I wondered if she was a hate at all. She was starting to look just about like a regular woman but a regular woman that was afeard and had four arms. But the way her eyes locked on me, I was pretty sure this was a regular woman. I also saw she didn't have no clothes on except in a rag hang across one of her shoulders. Seeing a grown up person naked like that was so shocking that I snatched my eyes off of her and looked down at the dirt in front of her feet. There were thick bands of iron hugging around her ankles connected up to some locks and chains that were keeping her where she was at. I was just as embarrassed to see these chains as I was to see that she didn't have no clothes on. I looked at the others so as not to shame her. The rest of them were men, and they weren't wearing nothing at all, not even a rag. Their ankles were covered with the same kind of thick iron shackles as the woman's. Their eyes were all on me, and they were looking just as scared and confused and surprised about seeing me as I was about seeing them. The forearm women hit, woman hissed again. Is you a real boy? I wasn't sure how to answer her. If she was a haint and thought I was one too, she might not do nothing to me. Besides, who else but a haint gonna have forearms? But if she wanted a haint and I told her I was one, maybe she'd put some kind of haint killing conjure on me and I'd be dead anyway. Instead of looking at her, I put my eyes up in the rafters of the stable, which was easy to do since whilst my mind was trying to figure out how to answer her question, I was still spread out on the floor being fragile. The waiting owl stared down 
just back down at me. I figured I'd best answer with the truth. I said, yes, ma'am, I'm a real boy. She whispered, if you's a hink, get on out of here. If you's a real boy, cut that foolishness and pick yourself out of that dirt. I tried to get back on my feet. I got up but kept my head down. A choky coughing sound came from the woman and I couldn't help but look. The sound was too tiny for a grown woman to be making. I saw a little black head and two little black arms coming out of the rag that was stretched out across the front. It was truly a load off my mind when I couldn't tell, even as dark as it was in the stable, she didn't have four arms at all. She was a woman holding on to a baby. Then I understood these weren't no chain demons. These were five runaway slaves and a baby that had been caught. I knowed what they were, but my head kept spinning anyway. She said, boy, yes, ma'am. She said, if you's real, go buy them horses in that stall behind you and fetch that bucket of water, but keep heshed. One of them patty rollers be over yon, liquored up. I looked to where she was pointing and saw another bundle on the right-hand side of the stable. Excepting for the shotgun leaning up against him, you'd have never known it was a white man. There was a leather bucket hanging from a nail, so I went and brung it to it in the drinking gourd that was next to it over to where the woman and the baby was squatted down. She reached out and touched my hand like she was making sure I was real, and then said, thank you, boy. She dipped the gourd in the water and propped the baby's head up so as it could get a drink. The baby hadn't showed no signs of being alive past a cough or two, but once it saw the water, it sprung up and commenced kicking its legs straight out and clawing at the gourd and sucking and slurping and lapping at the water like it hadn't had nothing to drink in two years. The sound of the baby going at the water stirred the men up something fierce. Two of them reached their hands out of me and strained up against their chains so as to get close to the bucket as they could. The woman mashed her finger against her lips and said, Hash them chains. You wants to wake that white man and get this here boy killed? There's plenty of water here. Just you wait. She waved her hand around a lot while she was talking to the men like they couldn't hear her good. She eased the gourd away from the baby and said, There now, darling. Go slow. Ain't no point in making yourself sick. But the child wasn't having none of her cautions. It snatched back at the gourd and bit on the side of it, breathing in water, splashing its mouth around like a sparrow in the puddle. The baby commenced to coughing again, and the woman took the gourd away. She dipped it back in the bucket and took a long pull herself. Two more times she did this, draining the gourd dry and then taking a breath so deep and so hard that it brung to mind someone who dived under a lake and then come back up right before the lungs were about to bust. She said, thank you, thank you kindly. Now give them men some. I stepped over to the man that was closest to her and set the bucket in front of him. He looked at it, then up at me. He raised his hands and I saw that his arms were tied up with, with heavy chains that were dangling off his wrists. I didn't know what to say or do. Ma and Pa and all the grown folks in the settlement had told us plenty of stories about folks in chains before, and a couple people in bucks didn't even have thick, shiny scars on their ankles and wrists from wearing them. But seeing the chains real weren't the kind of thing you could imagine. It weren't the kind of picture that words could ever paint. Maybe the grown folks were trying not to scare us when they told stories about folks being chained up, because judging by the way these people looked, I knowed we weren't getting the whole story. I felt my legs getting unsolid and rickety all over again. The woman said, boy, it's just my hands was free so as I can tend to my child. Them men's arms is chained and they can't reach their mouth. You's going to have to help them. I dipped the gourd into the water and raised it to the man's lips so he could drink. His eyes were blood red and swole up and crusted so as you'd have thought he had a good long hard cry. But there was something in his eyes that told you this weren't the man, kind of man that was likely to be bawling no matter what happened to him. Things had run out of his nose and were making the hair on his lip look gray. But the, up close, he seemed too young to be showing age that way. He was too strong looking. He was one of them men that got every muscle poking right out of him. Sort of like if he weren't careful, they'd come ripping right through his skin. His lips were cracked with long bloody splits, dividing him every little bit. 
His hair was caked up on one side with blood or mud like he got chunked there by a rock and never took the time to wash it out. He had one of his legs stretched out in front of him and there was a big rip out of the skin by his knee. It had got sewed up but not real good. It must have been from that bear fighting dog. He ducked his head at me once and then drank just as hard as a woman and the child. She said, he's a child's pa. Him and the other three's all full blood Africans. He don't talk a whole lot of English, but he ain't lost his man or so much that he ain't gonna say thank you kindly as you come out. The man ducked his head again. I said, you're welcome, sir. And once he had his fill, I went down the line water and the other man. The last one wasn't a man at all. He was a boy that looked like he was a little younger than me. His eyes were red and swole up and crusted too, but there weren't no doubt what caused this on him. It was crying. Even dark as it was, I could still see the gray tracks the tears had run down his cheeks left. His nose was crusted up and leaking even more than the man's. It was terrible to see. When he looked up at me, all I could think to do was to pull my hand up my sleeve and then reach my cuff over to wipe his nose and mouth off. He saw me raise my hand and flinch back like he was expecting me to bust him in the face. But he saw that what I was trying to do and leaned in. As soon as I wiped his nose, I gave him some of the water. Once he had his fill, he bent down and pulled my arm so as my hand was at his lips. He pressed his mouth there. It ripped my inside something harsh. He was acting like giving him a drink of water was no different than giving him a $20 gold piece. He wouldn't turn my hand loose. He started mumbling some African talk against it, then commenced to crying and quiet jerking noises that made his teeth rub up against my skin and made the chains on his arms and legs rattle. I pulled my hand away all of a sudden. I knowed what this odd smell in the stable was. It was fear. It was the smell of five grown folks and one baby that were afeard of everything. And that smell and the sight of these chain folks and the sounds they made every time they moved started making me sick to my stomach. I know it don't seem right, but all I wanted to do was get away from this boy, get away from these people before I throwed up. I left the bucket at the boy's feet and stumbled three steps backward. The woman whispered, no child, you's got to put it back just like it was. You's got to leave it like ain't no one been in here. When I got the bucket and gored back, she said, Come close. Keep your voice down. What you doing here? You work in this stable? They'd scared me so bad I'd plumb forgot about the preacher. I remembered what I'd swore to Mr. Leroy and told her, No, ma'am. I'm searching for the man that stole my friend's money. I looked at to the other end of the stable and the preacher was still standing there pretending he won't hear none of this. I draw Mr. Leroy's pistol out of my tote sack so as the preacher could see this war no bluff and said a little louder. He's going to give me Mr. Leroy's money back, else I'm going to gut shoot him down like a mad yeller dog. Having a gun in your hand when you know you were, you were going to use it to shoot a human person made it feel a whole lot different. When I'd used the preacher's old rusty gun to shoot stumps and stones, it didn't feel nowhere near as heavy as this one. The mystery pistol was shaking and sliding back and forth in my hand, same as a weather vane in a January storm. The four Africans drawed back once they saw that gun and the way it was jumping around in my hand. You could tell they knew what a pistol like this one could do to somebody. The woman said, now I've seen everything. A boy holding a man's gun fixing to shoot someone. But if you set on killing that man, you's too late, child. Looky there. He breathed his last just before sunset. Had quite the mouth on him, that one did. I know they weren't taking him nowhere. I knowed when they brung him in here and bust his teeth out and split his tongue in two, they ain't never going to treat no one what they's looking to sell like that. What they done with him, or well, nothing but play, nothing but sport. But you tell your friend that if that man stole something from him, he done paid a terrible price for it. You tell him that man stayed alive way past what you thought of someone could, and he never begged, and he cursed them patty rollers with every blow they put on him. Cursed him right to the end. So the right Reverend Deacon Dr. Zephariah Connolly III, the stealer of dreams, was dead. 
I was shamed because wrong as it might seem, the first thing that came flooding into my heart was reliefness because it meant I wasn't going to have to keep my word and kill him. I could see now it was the ropes that were keeping the preacher's arms spread out to the sides. He was sprung up twixt two beams. Another rope was wrapped round and round in his neck and was pinching his throat narrow and tight. I know that I am never going to be able to look at Emma's old doll birdie again without calling up thoughts about the preacher. The next thing that came into my heart made me made it sink right down into my brogans. There weren't no clothes on the preacher except him for a bloody rag round his knees. Mr. Leroy's money must be all gone. The woman said, put that thing down before you hurt someone. I put the preacher's gun back in my tote sack. She said, who you belongs to? She could see I was having a powerful hard time taking my eyes off the preacher, so she pulled at my arm. When I still couldn't quit looking at him, she turned my face as I was looking dead at her. Who you belongs to? The only thing I could think to say was, no one, ma'am. I'm my mom and pa's boy. She said, you sure do talk peculiar. Where are you born? You born? You from this here town? I said, no, ma'am, I was born free in, Bu in the Buxton Settlement in Canada West. Canada? Yes, ma'am. She said, how far is us from Canada? Took Mr. me and Mr. Leroy near about an hour to ride it, but we weren't tarrying at all. We were probably riding the horse too hard. She said, an hour? Yes, ma'am. No, say that ain't the truth. Say that's a lie, boy. No, ma'am, that's a swear for God truth. For the first time since I met her, she smiled. She held the baby away from her and said, Honey, I guess we just snake bit. We run all that time and falls one little hour short. One hour, child, we was that close. I expect we so close that we might even be breathing that free Canada air. I started to tell her that mostly the wind blows the other way from America over into Canada, but I figured that weren't she was aren't what she was talking about. I said, where's that man taking you, ma'am? She said, I expect me and Kamau and the baby's heading back to my missus in Kentucky. I can't say where they're taking the mother three. They don't talk no English at all. And Kamau say he don't talk, they don't talk the same African he do. I remembered all the stories we'd heard in classes about abolitionists and how they'd risk their lives for people to, who were just like these folks. I remembered how these stories got you so excited and mad and worked up that you wanted to charge down into America and free all the slaves. I remember how those stories near about made you cry when the grown folks would tell you how they felt when they finally got to Buxton and they pressed their left hands onto the Liberty Bell and they finally knowed how it felt not to be owned by nobody. I thought about all the time. I thought about all the times me and Cooter and Emma and our friends played abolitionists and slavers. The way we had to pull straws to see who would get to be the abolitionist, because didn't no one want to pretend to be somebody bad as a slave owner. I remember how we'd act like we were sneaking up on a plantation to kill the lot of slave masters and make a run for Canada with some happy, smiling, free slaves. I remember how easy it all was. But now I could see that our plan didn't have nothing to do with the truth. I could see how it was a whole lot harder when things were real and you had to worry about shotguns and chains and coughing little babies and crying folks without no clothes. Folks that were the same as me and Ma and Pa, except when they were near dead, except when they gave off a sad, peculiar smell. Except and they were chained in a way that I ain't never seen, even in the wildest, worstest animal chained. I know right then that if I got out of this stable in Michigan alive, I were not never going to play abolitionist again. Not just because all the fun had been took out of it, but mostly because I know that I weren't brave enough to even pretend to be one of them. And I know it would be kind of like pretending you were an angel. It was the kind of thing that would make you shamed the next time you ran into a real angel or a real abolitionist. It was the kind of thing that shouldn't involve, uh, kind of thing that shouldn't involve, oops, excuse me. It was the kind of thing that shouldn't have involved no, being involved in no sort of game. 
I looked at the woman and swore to myself, shotguns and chains or not, I was going to figure out a way to get her and these Africans out of here. Chapter 22, Bustin' Free.